Acts chapter 16. It is a new day and a new chapter. Uh, we've finished up chapter 15 last time. So today we'll begin uh, Acts chapter 16 and we'll read just the first five verses uh, this, this evening. Verse 1, Then came he to Derbe, and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This is the reading of God's Word. This is uh, where we're going to be uh, this evening. If I were to put a title on this, it would be Timothy Joins uh, Paul and Silas. And this is what's uh, primarily going on here in this, in this text. Uh, remember... From last time, Paul is on his second uh, missionary journey at this point. But this time, he's not with Barnabas, he's with Silas. If, you, if you'll recall, there was a, a division that happened. Uh, Barnabas and uh, Paul had a disagreement, and that disagreement was over uh, John Mark. And... Barnabas, uh, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them on the journey. Paul said no. He left us before. And uh, so the, the, the disagreement was so sharp between them that uh, Barnabas took off one direction with Mark. And uh, Paul left and, um, and, 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 and Silas uh, went with him. Took Silas and, and on they went. And so here's where we are. This is Paul's second missionary journey. Um, he's going back over some of the same places he went before. And he's visiting those churches which we would, um, these, these were churches, uh, the churches of Galatia. And as he starts out, he visits Derby and Lystra. It's significant that they're listed in this order. Uh, this is the reverse, uh, actually, of what was listed in chapter 14 and verse 6. Uh, if you go back there, then it says, They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Laconia, the region that lieth round about. So you see they're in the reverse order here in chapter 16. The reason is that they are now traveling from east to west. Previously they had come from Antioch. This time they're coming from Jerusalem. Uh, this, is, this is significant. Uh, significant because... Luke is writing this as a historical record. Um, he's writing this as a historical record, uh, part of a two-part series, actually. The first part is the Gospel of Luke. That would have been maybe uh, book one. Uh, and, then, and then book two is the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. This, 
this would have been uh, this two part series, this two volume set was quite possibly uh, being done, being written as a defense of Paul who was, who was being tried by the Roman authorities, at least at the time of the writing. And so this would have been submitted in defense of Paul. But, um, but uh, beyond that, and most importantly, the striking detail that we see in here, he was writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so we're reminded that these guys weren't just making up stories. They weren't just telling tall tales. These men, whether it's Luke or, uh, or any of the other writers of the New Testament, Matthew or Mark, John, wherever you're at in your studies in the, in the Scriptures, or even in the Old Testament, whether you're reading Moses or David or... You're, you're studying anything or written by any of those guys. Just recall that these men were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These aren't just any old books. These are books written. This is God's Word. But also recall that Lystra was where Paul had been stoned and left for dead. And so there's this human aspect in all of this as well. Paul is going back to the place where he'd been beat up and stoned and left for dead. I don't know about you, but I like comfort. I like, I like going places where people appreciate me. I enjoy being where people will pat me on the back and, 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 and treat me nice. I don't like going places where people despise me. I surely have never been stoned or beat up. But if I had, I... I would avoid that in the flesh. But not Paul. Paul had a great courage, a great zeal, a great love for the brethren, a concern for the lost, love for the Lord, and love for His Word. So much so that he understood the need for those people. He understood the doctrines of grace and the way of salvation. Sure, it was the grace of God working in and through Him, but at the same time, we understand that He fought the flesh and we need, we need that type of personality in our day. We need more men like that in our day. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of the Word of God. A man who was not driven by fear, or rather, fear doesn't drive. He wasn't crippled by fear, but he was driven by the courage that was necessary carry on the work of the Lord. The only way that that is possible is by God's grace, by being 
in the word and in prayer daily. I believe, I believe that, that the time is coming when we may face persecutions and troubles and trials much like what Paul did. We have much to learn from these men. The scripture here says in verse 1, it says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. This meeting of Timothy interested the feelings of the missionary and, his, and, 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 and those who were with him. Unless you're brand new to the New Testament, brand new to Christianity, brand new to the Bible, which you may be, um, perhaps those who are watching and whatever, I don't, I don't assume anything with anybody. But you know, if you've been around for a while, Timothy is an important figure in the early church history. important figure. He was a, he was a, a fr friend of Paul. Uh, he was he was a, 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 a he's there's two books of the Bible that are named after him. Uh, epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy. Very important. Here we're introduced to him. Timothy is mentioned by name some 24 times in the New Testament. He goes on to become one of Paul's missionary companions and friends in the ministry. Although he was much younger than Paul. It is pure speculation to try to say that Maybe this is why Paul came to this place and at this time. Maybe he did perhaps to find some, find or to gather Timothy to replace John Mark on his journey. But that's not written here. It's not spelled out for us. And so that would be speculation. Whatever the case is. Uh, we know that they met up at this place. And he's listed as a disciple here. That's telling. Being that he's listed as a disciple means that he was already saved. And in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy in his first letter, his first epistle, he says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. We know that he wasn't literally Timothy's father. But this manner in which that he wrote about him indicates that Paul had something to do with his conversion that Timothy had been saved under his ministry. Well, when did that happen? It must have happened during Paul's first missionary journey. What we gather from Acts chapter 16 and verse 1 right away is that 
he was the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. So he came from a mixed family. His dad was a Greek. His mother was a Jew. But that wasn't the biggest difficulty in that family. The biggest difficulty in that family would have been the fact that his mother was a believer and his father was not a believer. We get more information about this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verses uh, 3 through 5. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned or pure, the unfeigned or without hypocrisy, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. How did he figure that? Is a child who's born of a believer automatically just inherit some gene that makes that makes a person be a believer? No, no. It doesn't work like that. It's not like, oh, mommy had blue eyes, so there's a there's a possibility that I'm gonna have blue eyes. Watch this. Over in chapter three Chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. From the time that Timothy was old enough as a young child, he was learning the Scriptures. Well, how was he learning them? Was it Paul who came to his house to tutor him? No, Paul didn't meet him until Timothy was much older. Was it his dad when he came home from working and he, and he sat down with him to teach him those things? No, no. His dad was an unbeliever. His dad was not interested in the things of God. So where was this coming from? It was that unfeigned faith, that unfeigned faith of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. They're the ones who taught him the Scriptures. Now let me point out something here, and this is important to our text. Timothy is uncircumcised when they meet up with him in Acts chapter 16. Which tells me that in that family, that Jewish mother was able to teach young Timothy some things about the Scriptures, but there were some things that they weren't able to put into practice. Because 
She was married to a Greek man who did not believe the God of the Bible. There were some things, even though she sat down with young Timothy and taught him the things of the Scriptures, the Old Testament, because remember, when Timothy was a baby and when Timothy was young, there were no New Testament Scriptures. This was all Old Testament stuff. She taught him the law and the prophets. She taught him the things of God. But they weren't keeping the law like other Jewish families. Why? Because daddy was Greek. Daddy was an unbeliever. So there were some things that weren't happening in that house. Timothy was not circumcised like the other Jewish boys. that godly mother was doing what she could in obedience to the Lord as she served Him and she was obedient to her own husband. I believe we see something here that is very important. And I hope I can kind of tie this all together tonight. You see, over in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible tells us some things about marriage. About the wife and the husband. I want us to think for a moment about about Timothy's mother. I want us to think about Eunice for a moment. And what she was doing in those years as she was trying to raise up young Timothy. Even before Ephesians chapter 5 was even written. But how much more so is this important to us now that we have the complete Word of God? Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's not real popular in our day and age. It's not even popular in some churches. What the, what the English says is also what the Greek says. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is God's ordained headship. Notice it doesn't say, wives, submit yourselves unto all husbands or all men. This is wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything.
Paul comes along and meets up with Timothy. He's uncircumcised. Do you know why Paul doesn't get angry about that? Why he takes care of it? And we'll get to that here in a moment. Why he writes the way he does about Timothy's mother and grandmother and their unfeigned faith, even though they weren't keeping the law like the other Jews were, Because she wasn't responsible for that. Her husband was Greek. And as such, he either forbid him to be circumcised or he did not require it. But either way, she was married to this man And if there's ever an answer that has to be given before God as to why her Jewish son, Timothy, was not circumcised per the law of Moses, it wasn't, it, it wasn't his mother that had to give an answer about it. It would have been his father. Because he's the head of the house. She's not. Now that's a hard pill to swallow in our culture. But it's biblical. And even in some Christian circles, they say that male headship is a product of the fall. But let me tell you something. If you go back and you read the Genesis account, and I'm not going to go there tonight for time's sake, but if you go back and you read the creation account again, understand, Adam was made before Eve. Eve was made for Adam. Let me back up for a moment. Let me just put it, put it to you this way. The man was made before the woman. The woman was made for the man. When she was made, the woman was brought to the man. And when she was given a name, she was named by the man. And when you get into the New Testament, in the book of Romans, the scripture tells us that sin entered into the world Through a man, not through a couple, but through a man. The world hates that idea. They absolutely do not like it. But that's the biblical order. Understand. Understand something. There are some things that are non negotiable. And in that household, Eunice ran with what, what she knew was non negotiable. She made sure her son was taught the scripture. 
even though she couldn't put it all into practice. Wives are not told to submit to their husbands only when they're worthy, only when they've earned it, or for that matter, only if they're saved. Understand, when two people get married, a saved person ought to marry a saved person. But there are situations in which it happens where a saved person is married to a lost person. I don't know the story of this couple. Maybe Eunice was saved after she'd already been married. I don't know. But I've heard some women talk like as if, well, I don't respect my husband because he's not worthy or he doesn't deserve it or he's not saved. Hold up. Hold up. Pump the brakes. Let's look at this. Let's flip this over for a minute and look at Men are to love their wives. Are we to love our wives only when they deserve it? No. What's the picture here? The picture, marriage is a relation, is a reflection of the relationship between Christ and His church. Your spouse may not meet all of your expectations. But how else will you learn unconditional love? I guarantee you that Christ loves you when you don't deserve it. Oh, how we, how we ought to remember these things. You see this? He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Why do we do this? Because the Lord said so. Do it as unto the Lord and God will bless. And He did bless. What little bit that poor woman could do she could have said, oh, my home is broken. My husband, he's not leading us in prayer. He's not leading us in Bible study. She could have nagged him and nagged him and nagged him until he wished he was dead. But he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. So she said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach Timothy the Scriptures. And so she sowed some seed in Timothy's life. And she said, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do with it. We can't even put none of this in practice. I haven't even been able to circumcise my own son. He's not saved. She sowed some seed. Many years later, along came the missionary preaching. And Timothy was saved. And not only that, but later, Timothy became a preacher. A missionary. How many families are lost? Children are lost. Even when the mother is saved because the mom says, oh, I can't, 
I can't get my husband to lead us in Bible study. I can't get my husband to take us to church. And so she does nothing. Learn from this mother of Timothy. Even if you can't get the whole family off to church. Even if you can't get everything in the Scriptures put into practice, at least Teach the Scriptures where you can. And be obedient to your husband. It's a struggle. That's why it's important to be very careful who you choose as a mate. Jill and I agree on most things. But headship is important. Even on those things where we disagree. If we can't come to an agreement, there comes a time where I have to make a decision. Thankfully, that hasn't happened very often in our marriage, but... If it does, and I'm wrong, she's not to nag at me and say, see, I told you so, but rather she's to pity me and pray for me as the one who bears responsibility because I bear a weight that she doesn't. You understand that? The husband, the man of the house, the head of the home, bears a weight Again, back to the garden. Adam and Eve both ate of that fruit. But when everything, and, and when everything f f fell apart, and Adam and Eve tried to cover it up and they hid themselves. Who did God go looking for? He didn't go calling for Adam and Eve. He went out looking for Adam. Calling for Adam. On that fearful day, in that frightening moment, God's voice rang through that garden, and it wasn't calling Eve's voice, or rather, it wasn't calling Eve's name, it was calling Adam's. It was Adam who needed to give an account. Burst. Timothy's mother submitted to her unbelieving husband as best she could. And even in those homes where it's broken, post-fall, it may not be a perfect picture, but it is a picture. It is a picture. And may we always remember that in this day and age where Ephesians 5 is a battleground. Back to Acts chapter 16. We, we, we kind of get this, this story of Timothy's background. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God uses people even from broken homes or homes that may not be perfect. God calls men from places that maybe aren't the best, most ideal situations. Verses 2 and 3. Says, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Paul, <laughs> Paul gets in touch with Timothy. And Timothy was well reported on by the brethren. You know, that's important too. 
It, it, in, in other words, he wanted to make sure that Timothy was doing what was right, that he was living right. He checked him out. Checked him out. He was well reported on by the brethren. He was who he said he was. He was He was truly a follower of Christ. But before he could go on his trip, Paul has him circumcised. And I told you I'd get back to this. That's a pretty odd thing considering that that so we just spent uh, the greater part of Acts chapter 15, this great controversy dealing with circumcision. The legalistic Jews had come in and they had said, hey, before that the Gentiles can be saved, they've got to be circumcised. Remember they torn, they got people all torn up about it in Antioch and in Jerusalem and all those things happened. There was a council call by Antioch there at Jerusalem and all, all those things. Some say Paul was being inconsistent, but I don't believe so. Um, let's remember something. The, 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 the Jews in Acts chapter 15, they were saying that in order to be saved, the Gentiles had to be circumcised. But Timothy was already saved. Now, Titus, who, who was a Gentile, uh, he, he isn't circumcised. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay, so Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. Titus was full-blooded Greek. Okay, no need for you to be circumcised, Titus. You're 100% Greek. You have no need to be circumcised. Well, what did? Why did he do this with Timothy? Well, it's right there in our text in Acts chapter 16. He did it because of the Jews. Titus was fully Greek, but Timothy, Timothy was half Jew and half Greek. Titus, no, Titus shouldn't be circumcised. Paul would be seen as promoting the cause of the enemy if he would have had Titus circumcised. But but Timothy? Timothy, part Jew, well, he's going to be working with Jews, and they're going to wonder why he wasn't circumcised. They'll be offended. They'll be offended. What's this, Timothy? You're Part Greek and part Jew is your Greek ancestry more important than your Jewish ancestry? And to us, it doesn't mean anything. But to the Jew, it means a lot. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You and I, we're, we're here in America. We like to think about, you know, oh, it's our right to do this. It's our... This is the way we are, and all that sort of thing, but we should consider our, and be more considered about 
our other brothers and sisters in Christ and those who may be offended and we should try not to offend others as best we can. Look at what Paul wrote here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 19, going down to verse 23. Paul said, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became a, as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without law being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And so, he wanted to go out of his way not to offend these people. And, um, and I can't stress this enough. What the council had talked about, what their discussion was, was whether circumcision and keeping of the law was necessary for salvation. This had nothing to do with that. Timothy would be working with both Jews and Gentiles and it was necessary that he not offend them. The Gentiles didn't care one way or another whether he was circumcised or not, but the Jews cared. They cared deeply. And for the gospel's sake, it was better for him to be circumcised. It had nothing to do with him going to heaven or not, but it had everything to do with the gospel and the preaching of the gospel as a Jew. He would prove to be a great asset to the work that God was doing in and through these men. And so he was circumcised. Verses 4 and 5 there in Acts chapter 16 as we bring this to a close it says and as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. They, meaning Paul and Silas, and now Timothy, delivered to the churches the letter that had been written by the Jerusalem council uh, if you go back there to Acts chapter 15, um, verse 20 says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. And so, uh, in verse 29, it says, They abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, from things strangled, from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, very well. These were things that they should do because of the, of the Jews who were there in those cities, the synagogues, and so on and so forth. And we talked much about that as we went through uh, Acts chapter 15. They delivered this to the churches, to the places they went. Um, these are not binding rules on us, so don't worry. You can, you can eat your meats and that sort of thing. Um, at least, I should, let me, let me back up. These are not all binding on us. You can go and eat your meats and that sort of thing. Some of it is, right? So uh, abstaining from fornication and, and, uh, and then also um, uh, we want to make sure that we uh, stay
stay away from idolatry, although meats offered to idols, they, they're fair to you. The Bible tells us that the churches were established in the faith, that they were, well, as he puts it here, they increased in number daily. This would have happened by the preaching of the gospel, by the decrees of the elders that were delivered to them, and then also uh, the encouragement, just the encouragement of those missionaries as they traveled through. So remember, there were those that came in to try to spread heresies, trouble them and all that sort of thing. But these brethren would have encouraged them. So God blessed them so much insofar that they were increased uh, in numbers, increased in the faith, and, uh, and, and that as they went from place to place, carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truths of God's word. We'll go ahead and stop there uh, with verse 5 and we'll carry on more really next time. May God add a blessing to His Word. We'll go ahead and have a season of prayer. And, uh, so I'll ask uh, Brother Craig, if you will, to begin. And then I'll